Welcome to Lovecraft Live, the official instant Twitch companion piece to Shout on TV, Lovecraft Country. I am your host, Gene Lyons, and Ash will be short will be joining me shortly, or shorting me jointly. Uh, and this will be a quick interactive look at how uh, we and you, the audience, felt about the Lovecraft Country episode we just watched. Rewind, rewind to 1921. This is the penultimate episode of the season. And also what we're going to cover in Wednesday's Deep Dive podcast. Lots of positive comments out there in the chat. I'll get to those in a second. Uh, just some housekeeping here. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast for the last few weeks. Just to make sure you don't miss an episode, you can do that wherever you get your podcast or by visiting shadowntv.com slash subscribe. And be sure to join us uh, later in this week on Tuesday. Uh, we have the Raised by Wolves uh, special at 9.30 Eastern. It'll just be a one-shot, uh, me, Big D, and Ash doing uh, Raised by Wolves. Uh, and then, of course, on Wednesday, getting by with the King B. Then we're back here Friday for Shappy Hour. And, of course, Lovecraft Live, the final Lovecraft Live next Sunday. So you can check out all that uh, right here on Twitch. Uh, lots of emails rolled in over the weekend and over the week and even some tonight already. So it's going to be a very, very busy week uh, for all of us. Um, so let's go ahead and check out the comments. Uh, so we got Holosaurus out there saying that uh, it was a powerful episode. You saw through two thirds of the episode. Time travel is my favorite genre. Uh, yeah, and you know, interestingly enough, uh, I you know I think I picked up immediately on that um, on that Back to the Future vibe, and uh, and I was like, man, I hope they take this somewhere poignant, right? This is not just going to be like a homage to back to future and that's it now big d i would love to hear his opinion on this episode because he is such a time travel junkie like seriously the guy even likes time writer like he is 
all about time travel movies. Uh, and I think I thought it was uh, executed really well in this episode as well. Um, and yes, the payoffs at the end were really, really uh, great. <laughs> actually, something I want to talk about for the deep dive is how they patched so many, not patched actually, but like they left holes open through the season so that you could have this big payoff in this episode. I thought it was really, really well done. Uh, Aaron Sun says it was uh, her favorite episode of the season. Hey, Ash, how's it going? Um, and Internet Hippo says that the show is peaking at the right time. Honestly, I don't know if I'd call this the peak of the season, but it is definitely taking advantage of the groundwork that was laid before. Ash, how you doing? Hey, guys. I'm good. Okay, good. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, interested to see what you guys uh, thought of it. Letty sneakers, I, I think they couldn't have done anything more than putting a fucking like, close-up on them like... Look at these shoes from another time. They had they had everything. Now, listen, I know women's footwear that fits and is comfortable is hard to find. And so maybe in the hotel, they had the opportunity to uh, find uh, uh, clothing for everybody else. Really nice fits on all of those. I mean, Montrose's suit was perfect. But Letty apparently could not find shoes uh, that worked for her. So that's uh, so that's OK. Um, yeah, shout out to Hippolyta's hair turning blue, uh, almost like it was like, uh, you know, that we got a, a foreshadowing in the in episode uh, seven. So we got a, a payoff there as well. Uh, let's scan back through here. And oh, another. OK, so another some more tears uh, over this episode. Um, but yeah, but but you guys are absolutely right. Uh, I was watching the episode. Sarah and I were watching the episode. and It was like Letty at the end. I'm like, yes, I get that you're invulnerable, but like. You got the book. Like, let's go. Like, like you're not. You can't time travel. You know, forever. I guess you got. I guess you got uh, thirty years to make it back to your present time. Maybe she's just planning on waiting it out. Ash, what'd you think? Um, I thought it was a really amazing premise. Um, this idea of like facing your ancestors and facing like the, um, the the harm and the darkness of your past i think that that was really interesting um i thought it really worked in parts i thought the montrose tick um exchanges especially in the alleyway i thought were really powerful i think we got to see um i mean michael k williams he was amazing yeah. in this episode and when he was standing and you know overlooking tulsa from the window of the hotel and kind of reciting what happened to everyone i thought that that was really beautiful um i i you you just literally just took the words out of my mouth talking about letty i thought it was ridiculous how slow she was walking um i thought that was insane i also really didn't like the melting person as she held her hand like i think we would have been fine like just having them say the prayer right and then like you know move on um also how did the book not burn i would like to know that um magic well, it burned in 21, and that's why they had to go back in time. So I don't know how good the fucking magic is there, too. Shit, you got me. Because um, it hadn't been opened yet. That's that's it. It's protected by the fact that it's sealed. No, because it still burned in 1921. Because they opened it. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, you're right. No. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Oh, because Lenny was uh, holding it. It's like it's like the Flash is speed force. If he's, you know, it's why his clothes, like the why the Flash's so clothes don't tear off when he runs real fast. So if she hugs Tick real tight next episode, he'll be all right. Or he, uh, she could have just hugged uh, her what great aunt yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it would have been fine. Yeah, I mean that that you know I I don't know I I am not a fan of time travel things. They drive me nuts. Yeah, the ticks in them drive me nuts. Um, that's why I hated Avengers. No pun um, intended. Yeah. Uh, Avengers Endgame is because of all the time travel mishaps. I think that you get yourselves into some really like crazy um, holes. But I, I overall, I liked it. I wish that we'd have more time with D, like figuring out what was wrong with her. I was super <laughs> bummed that they, you know, just sucked the magic out of her so quickly because I thought that was really fascinating. And did she morph into one of the Topsy dolls or did they put? the lipstick on her and do her hair like that before they took the spell I, out of her. So I think a lot of times the show, Ash, like at least my take on it, like I try to, you know, we do this as, as, as we watch the shows to like give them the benefit of the doubt. It's like, what were they going for there? And I, my only guess is like, it was an homage to the exorcist. 
So it was like, because they the, the way that they shot it with her in the bed, it was like it felt very exorcist to me. I expected her to like sit up and her head start spinning, like yeah, you know, and start you know, banging, her, banging herself with a uh, with a with a crucifix. Um, I did have a question for Coach Marcus, who said that you know he that it's the first time he shed a tear in a lot of time for TV. I wonder what about it uh, made you guys uh, emotional, particularly you, Coach Marcus. Also, Sarah pointed out uh, that uh, that the the hair. I didn't get it. Thank you guys. Or thank you, sir, for pointing it out. That it wasn't that that she became the living version of Dee's comic book character. I'm like, oh, which was basically about her anyway. Yeah, Ronthea right? Blue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, did, I thought it was just the t- t- touching back to the trippy episode, episode seven. So, yeah. Um, Black Nerd says Emmy, Golden Globe, uh, and SAG Awards for Michael K. Williams. Listen, this for me, if the episode did nothing else, and Ash, I know I hate to steal your your catchphrase here, but if it does nothing else, he, putting him on display and showing what he's capable of, uh, even with and guys, forgive me, forgive me, but even with some really clunky scripting, like some of the writing in the beginning, I was like, you guys have clearly never written sci-fi because like people don't say things like like forcing characters to repeatedly say autumnal equinox. Nobody fucking says that. It's it's just weird, right? But but that's a testament to the the power of his acting. Where I was like immediately forgot about all that, and I was just like, "Holy shit, this guy's put on a fucking clinic tonight." Yeah, he was incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, so uh, other um, you know, and Coach Marcus says the time paradox made sense. Standing around burning to death was a little much. That was there strictly so someone could do an effect. And I do, you know, Coach Marcus, I think you're absolutely right on that. A lot of times I was like, again, with the bomb too, like you know, we know that she's invulnerable. Like we know that she can't be hurt. She's walking down the street and the airplane drops two, not one, but two bombs directly on her. And again explaining it to myself i go okay this is tying back to the dream the flames with hannah and walking through the artem lodge and that's what's going on you know there but ash i was curious uh if, if anything like really um caught your attention or made you go oh i want to research this thing or explain that was there anything you know in particular for you um not i'll be very honest this is a pretty straightforward episode um, I mean, we have the answers about what's going on with Hippolyta and why she's able to run the machine, Hi, right? Like, we we have the answers about why they had to get the book. I mean, we know what happened with the Tulsa Massacre. I mean, I do think it's worth talking about the Tulsa Massacre on the show the same way we did Emmett Till last week. Because I think there were a lot of people who didn't know the the true history of Emmett Till. And I think that we would be irresponsible to not do the same thing this week with the Tulsa Massacre. Sure. I think that we should chat about it. Um, I... Yeah, I mean, there wasn't a lot this week, I think, that's going to be important to the plot other than the fact that um, they've got the Book of Names now. And that's clearly going to change the end game because Christina now doesn't have the only copy of things. But I don't know. I've got to rewatch it. It was a short episode. Yeah, it was about um, 10 minutes short. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I need to go back and... And rewatch in terms of in terms of what I want to quote unquote research. Um, I did love I, I, I hate a cheesy moment most of the time, but I did really love the great little Easter egg when Ruby said when she pictures herself being white, she always pictures herself being a redhead, which was a callback to the book. I thought that was very well done. Um Internet- I don't know what that- Oh, what about you? Uh, Internet Hippo uh, said that that you know uh, said I confess I wasn't quite sure what happened between Hi, Christina and and Lancaster and like particularly William Lancaster. I need that explained to me because I was like, okay, so you yep. reverse engineered your invulnerability or your your metamorphosis spell so that you can make him die a death, but you wanted a thousand deaths, so you settled for one. Again, guys, forgive us if you're watching this like three days from Sunday and you're like, you don't fucking get it. And I'm like, we just watched the episode. Like we've had no time to look back or even rewind and watch it again. So if anybody out there really, really got that, please like let me know or Ash if you did, because I need to like kind of watch that scene again, go back, comb back through the dialogue and figure out what exactly the thinking was there. But we did get confirmation that is not his torso that they have been essentially killing and taking black bodies, taking ownership of them, uh, you know, and sewing it back basically into Lancaster's body. Um 
So, so for me, Ash, the I think the the thing that I want to really like focus on for this episode for the deep dive actually is, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit before, was this um, uh, the fact that I identified a lot of what I considered holes earlier in the season, where they just kind of left these like awkward, um, what I consider cracks in the framework of the show, and I see now that this episode did a lot of work, whether it was intentional or not, to to patch those. Or not even to patch those, I shouldn't say, to to fill them. Uh, it was like an incomplete puzzle and just putting those pieces in. And so going into episode 10, it is so critical in your penultimate episode. And you see great TV shows do this all the time. To fill that all in and get everything set up so that you don't have many lingering questions except for the one question they want you to you know to focus on, which is how will this standoff go? So I thought that was, that was pretty uh, well done. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so Coach Marcus, absolutely stealing bodies had to be resurrected. But what what the fuck was William doing exactly? I think that it was the explanation was kind of forced and a little bit poorly executed. So I need to go back and watch that again because I didn't catch it at first blush, and I pay pretty fucking close attention to the TV show. So uh, I'm interested well, in seeing where that goes. When Lancaster knows it's Christina, how does he know that? You know, like how long is he know? Because he he calls William Christina twice, so yeah. like he knows and. I don't know. That felt like a really like unnecessary scene. I would have been fine with the police captain just being dead last week. Say again. I would have been fine with Lancaster just being dead yeah. last week. Like, yeah, I don't seemed, think we needed that. Seemed, yeah, it's a little weird. Uh, Half Bake says when Tick stepped in to save the kids with the baseball bat, it reminded me of the opening in the first episode with the baseball player Jack Robinson, and they in fact mentioned that in this episode. That it was, you know, stepping up and cracking heads like Jackie Robinson. And then he says the, you know, I got you, kid, which is from that dream in the beginning. Yeah, so absolutely, uh, you know, a, a tie in there. Um, one thing, guys, I forgot to mention is how to support this stream because, uh, listen, uh, we love sharing this time with you. But these streams have had uh, increasing viewership and decreasing support, which – doesn't feel super great. So just to point out, so big thanks to Sarah and All Might for your cheers, CW Jackson for following us, and Shadow Time for subscribing. But that's literally all the support we've gotten during this time. Uh, as we look to do things in the future, we have to really look at what the best use of the time. And what we're seeing right now is not a huge, like, um, and- thank you, Aaron Sun, for the 100-bit cheer. Um, so we're also down to, le- like, fewer than 60 subscribers, where we had over 100 last month. So, guys, very, very important. I know you're still watching, but if you're not subscribing, uh, I understand, like, you got a lot on your mind. You got a lot of shit going on. But it's, like, it takes you, like, a minute or two to do that. Thank you, Zuber, for the 500-bit cheer. That was huge. Appreciate that. Very generous of you. And Susan Brew as well. Again, kind of the same name is popping up, which is which is awesome. We, we appreciate your support. But I know there's a lot of you out there who are watching, and you might be wondering, how do I, su- how do I support them? Yes, you can cheer, and that helps. Hey, but if you've got no money or you're just a cheapskate, that's okay too because you can uh, subscribe through Amazon Prime. So your Amazon Prime account has Twitch Prime included every month. You can just go through, connect that to your Twitch Prime, subscribe to us. That helps us out. doesn't cost you anything. But it really, really does make a difference because, like, I'll be honest with you. Uh, if you're doing a thing and you start seeing fewer and fewer people support it, the logical conclusion is not a lot of people like this thing and we should probably do something else. So, And that's not like a condemnation of you guys. It's like we would just start thinking, what the fuck else can we do with our time that's that's worthwhile to people? So anyway. Yeah. 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 No, I totally get that. Um, I will say it's been really cool getting to meet some of you guys that are email people. Like, and we've gotten to meet you on the stream finally. And that's been really amazing. And another way that you can support us is by passing the word along, you know, tell people about our shows, tell people leaving us reviews on iTunes. We've actually gotten some really great reviews lately. Um, So a shout out to those of you that have taken the time to go and leave those reviews. We really appreciate that because, you know, the tagline is that's how it helps the podcast grow. But like that truly is one of the ways that helps our podcast grow. So thank you so much to those of you who've left some really kind reviews lately. We, we see them, we appreciate them. They make our mornings because we wake up to them because they hit it like 4 a.m. on our uh, on our Slack. So thank you for that. So Shadow Time uh, and Black Nerd have kind of teamed up to explain that whole Lancaster scene. So basically when Ruby had that magical piece dropped uh, off at the police station or or at Lancaster's office, uh, that was to control his magic. And essentially that um, so basically Christina not her father figured out invincibility was useful for healing. She also figured out that she could curse people. So she slipped the artifact in the desk to prevent him from healing himself with magic. Um, 
I get that part. It was I think it was William's words that I tripped up on. Like I like I got that it was the artifact as he was very prominently displaying it, but yeah. it was the fact that he was like, uh, you know, oh, I, I, you know, it was to make someone die a thousand deaths, but I'll settle for one. I'm like, okay, what? Um, well, and like, what were those other two cops doing? As William just sat there holding up this magical piece that's killing their friends. Well, I guess you know he's invulnerable, so they're like, oh. So remember, so William's the guy. So I think the reason why Lancaster knows that William is Christina is because he killed William, right? So he's like, oh, shit, you must be Christina back. Again, I, this is like Gene yeah, but like that's explains. Quite a jump. Yeah. yeah, like quite a jump. Hey, you must be dead, so you must be a woman. Like, you must be Christina. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, like, it's kind of like a random, like, jump. Yeah, you know, magic. It's literal right. hand waving. Sense, it's literal like, hand waving. You brought yourself back to life, not right. you're a woman inside. Oh, Shadow Time, that's very sweet of you. So Shadow Time says, as an aside, glad to see Ash weather the storm. Yeah, so everyone was very worried during Shappy Hour uh, oh. that you that, – yeah, how is it going? How's Delta? And so, so Jean thought I was dead. Let's just go ahead and throw that out there because I got, you know – um so what happened was is our internet went out because we didn't get rains or anything but like the winds were insane we were getting gusts up to 45 50 miles an hour and so it knocked out our power it knocked out our internet I was waiting for the internet to restart fell asleep woke up to go get finn it took 10 hours to get finn because he was in new orleans it took 10 hours what, what should have been a five and a half six hour drive because of all the stuff i had to drive over part of an 18 wheeler which was crazy um like it was just insane and y'all i i said this after laura and i apologize for turning lovecraft country into this but like if you're going to donate to anyone donate to the people of lake charles louisiana because they lost absolutely everything during laura and driving through there on saturday they've lost everything that they had just rebuilt again and it was horrifying um nobody should be hit by a hurricane once much less twice in a six-week period you know like charles is about an hour and 40 minutes from here and it was utterly insane so donate to them but but yes i'm glad to be here i'm glad i'm not dead um, but there was no self service from Baytown, Texas, all the way to Lafayette, Louisiana. I mean, it was absolutely crazy. So, donate, send food. It was, I mean, those people are hurting right Where, now. Where's a good place to go to do that again? Um, so, I would do anywhere but the Red Cross. The Red Cross doesn't actually get supplies to people that are victims of hurricanes. Um, they're a terrible organization. Um, I would say Catholic Charities is a great, even if you're not Catholic, Catholic Charities does great hurricane relief work. Um, then you also could just Google Lake Charles Relief. There's tons of organizations that have popped up in Lake Charles itself um, that are taking donations from from lots of different places. So um, I'll try to I'll try to pull some and and, and you know and, and post it um, because I think that they need they truly need a tremendous i mean like their their electrical grid had just come back on and now it's back out again so like i mean it's and there's no coverage of it because the world is insane and all the other things that are going on but think about it we're in the middle of a pandemic and they don't have electricity so everybody's all next to each other there's no place to get medical care i mean it's just it's a really it's it's always a shitty situation but it's like really shitty in 2020 yeah it seems like it from what i've seen i was watching the you know, news coverage, the closest to Arizona to get to a hurricane is like on those weather maps. And it was like Houston and New Orleans and then Lake Charles and just the fucking like, hurricane, like threading right between them. And it was pretty, pretty phenomenal. I mean, it's pretty insane that, like you said, it was, you know, within 13 miles of where, you know, was it Laura, you said? Hit? Yeah, 13 yeah. miles of Laura. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's and, and what's terrible is it was worse for Lake Charles because it was on the windier side of the storm because Delta was not a rainstorm. It was only like two inches of rain. Mm. It was a windstorm. I mean, that's why even here in Houston, we had such bad winds um, because it was a windstorm. And so we had tropical storm conditions here an hour and 45 minutes away. So like they got, I mean, they got hammered. They got hammered again. Uh, so I put up a poll to ask people if they think Atticus will die in the finale. So Tick in this episode is presented with the, you know, the idea that he is kind of not, not necessarily accepted, but kind of understands that his death is imminent. Um, and, you know, and that we expect to see, I mean, we see in the spoiler alert previews for 
uh, episode 10 that it looks like he's in a similar scenario to what Gia saw as his, you know, death scene. Right. And so I, I put up the poll, of, you know, will he die in the, in the final episode? Overwhelmingly people said, uh, no, he's, he's not going to die. Um, and then I, uh, and, but a few people said, you know, yeah, um, I, I'd be interested to see how they go with this. What, what I found was fascinating though, Ash, is that, you know, when the season started, I looked at the, um, at the episode list and I was like, Oh, we're going to get through the book. Like, Immediately, right? Like, it's going to be, like, 10 episodes will be done. I don't even know how they're going to, you know, like, it's going to be a very quick season, start to finish, and we're going to do it. Now it seems like I got I got the feeling that, you know, they might leave some material for a second season, uh, which would be um, interesting. Unlike Watchmen, which I think did a, a very, very smart move by wrapping it all up in one season and having, I think, a, a pretty tremendous ending. Yeah, I mean, I think... And I've said this before, I mean, I've grown to respect and appreciate Watchmen even more through doing this show. Um, I, I, Yeah, but I, I don't think Tick's going to die. I think that they're clearly setting up that Montrose is going to sacrifice himself for him. Mm. So I think we're going to find out he is really his father and that that's, you know, he's going to die, that that's going to be a big reveal. So um, that's what I think is going to happen. Yeah. But. Black Nerd says by de- by declaring repeatedly he's going to die, the writers are shouting, "Tick lives!" It's yeah, right. close. I- I'm glad Ash that you brought up Montrose uh, because I thought that you know again I want to be very very clear that that sections of this writing I thought were clunky, and I think a lot of people in the audience agree who are fans of the show. I mean, people who said that they were emotional about this episode and love this episode still said that it had some weaknesses there, and I think that uh, the alley scene. Uh, between Montrose and Ash, that conversation, or Ash <laughs> and Tick was, uh, I see you and all the hero characters. Uh, but, uh, but no, but the, but that, that, um, that conversation between them was some incredible writing. And I was like, it revealed so many things to me that I never considered. One of which being that, you know, we, we, when we consider, uh, um, uh, uh, gay rights. And by the way, today is uh, uh, coming, out day. coming out. Yeah, national coming out mm-hmm. day. But when we think about gay rights, and, and often the the framework that we think about is the right to marry, uh, the right to you know uh, against job uh, discrimination, the right to adopt children. Um, one of the things that I never considered, uh, and, and this is on me. This is how short sighted and myopic you know I the world of a of a straight man can be, is that I was like, oh shit, if you wanted to be a dad. You could not be out like that was that was it. And so and of course, there are people who have those two impulses, the the imp- or not impulses, but the, the identity and the impulse, right? The identity of I am homosexual. And yet at the same time, I want to be a parent and how fucking insanely recent that was the thing that you could you could do. And I was like, God, the pain that generations, uh, uh, uh you know, of gays mm-hmm. and lesbians in the, in the queer community, like basically had to endure not like you had to make a life choice. Do you want to be yeah. a parent or do you want to be gay? I mean, that was one of the best lines of the whole series. I think so far as when he says that was just the first sacrifice in a long line of yes. them in order to be your dad. And, and I think that, I mean, one of the things that I relate to is, Hi, y'all. so I watched this, I binged this stupid show last night when I couldn't sleep called death you. And it's all about these people that go to an all, hearing impaired college and uh, i promise that this is connected Mm -hmm. and so in watching it like all of the the 20 somethings on here are like totally fucked up and they talk about how their parents fucked them up because their parents got divorced and their parents did this and their parents did that and i'm sitting here going i mean i started to panic going holy shit like what are we doing to our kids like what are our kids like Maddie and tom's kids like what are our kids gonna say and like so i was already in that mind frame and so while watching mantras and clearly there's never any excuse for physical abuse i'm not trying to make excuses for him but i'm sitting here watching it like as a parent going like you're always fucked as a parent because you're human and you're always going to mess up your kids because you bring your own baggage to that relationship. Like you do all relationships, but it's especially fucked up because your kids are so vulnerable. And so they suffer at the hand of all of your idiosyncrasies in a way that like you can't prevent. So no matter what you fuck up your kids and we've thought of mantras as this villain the whole time much like how tick has his whole life he's thought of him as this villain and it was so wonderful in the past few episodes to have it unpacked for us that he isn't a villain he's a broken man that was horribly abused and couldn't break generational cycles of abuse like that's what it was and 
I really related to that as a parent, because even though I don't hit my children and I don't think I have the same, I don't bring the same type of baggage that Montrose does. I bring my own baggage to my kids, you know, and we bring the suffering of our ancestors and the generations before us or the suffering we bought on other people. We bring all of that forward into our children and into our families. And I think that's a really, that I thought was one of the most powerful parts of this episode is these generational cycles. We're seeing them literally on screen with them going back in time and visiting Montrose's childhood and seeing what made him who he was. And then also just metaphorically this idea of, you know, the book of names truly is like bringing forward this heritage that is a weight and that is a a burden uh, in a sense. And I, I think they're doing a great job. You can tell that Jordan Peele and J.J. Abrams are both parents and Misha Green, like all of them, because they're doing such a beautiful thing of exploring what it's like to be a parent and how fucked up being a parent is sometimes and how hard it is no matter what your circumstances and I thought that was really beautiful to see all of that kind of play out with and and we've talked about Michael K. Williams but I mean Jonathan Majors I mean he also kicked ass this episode with his acting I mean he did a beautiful job so also, I, you know, I, I think that we um, in, in the episode uh, and I am in that episode, we you know, we didn't um, uh, we focus on so many things uh, other than than Hippolyta and our coverage of her. And again, it just comes to basically when we try to do the podcast, we try to explain the things that we think are people on people's minds as we hear them here and as we anticipate it. And so it was more a lot of times you'll hear us cover not the obvious topic because we feel like the obvious topic has been covered by the show you know, enough that we don't really need to get on it. But Hippolyta, I felt like um, there was even a bit of payoff from that episode where, you know, she comes back and I was like, I felt like the show was like, just like stuck in like molasses until she showed up in this episode and was like, let's get the fucking work. Like stop talking, you know, because there was just this like people just babbling at each other. And she got there and she kicked everything into fucking gear. And then, then there was some really strong sci-fi elements of like, listen, I was on this other fucking planet for the equivalent of 200 years. I know my shit. Let's fucking go. And it was like, okay, cool. Yeah. It felt, I had some very Buffy vibes from that. And I was like into that mm-hmm. a lot. So Me too. Me too. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Well, uh, listen, thanks for hanging out with us for this half hour while we did Lovecraft Live. Uh, we do have the deep dive coming up. Please, please, please uh, write into us at host a shot on TV.com with your thoughts on this episode. Um, there were some explanations in the chat as well about uh, the uh, the Lancaster scene as well, saying essentially maybe it wasn't a limit of the magic, but in fact that Christina had decided at this point, I, I would have liked to kill you a thousand times, but I got shit to do. So we're just going to have to do it wasn't a limit of the magic, but more limit of time because you got the autumnal equinox coming up which is still hard to say let's just call it the equinox and uh and 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 getting him off the off the playing board right getting him off the chessboard is is what has to happen now to move on so anyway write in about that uh also if you'd like to call us leave a voicemail we'd love those 914-719-CHAT and um and you know let us know what you'd like to cover for the deep dive uh, whether it's uh, in the chat right now um or by emailing us and we'll record that tomorrow night We'll put that out on Wednesday and then one more episode, guys. And that's going to be it. One more Lovecraft Live, one more deep dive, and then we put this uh, we put this to, uh, to baby bed. To bed. Put this baby mm-hmm. to bed. Or as Ash says, put this child down. Um, and and that, Tuesday's Raised by Wolves. Yeah, and Tuesday's Raised by Wolves. Uh, so that'll be at uh, 9.30 Eastern. Bro, so bro, uh, if you missed that at the beginning, uh, we'll, uh, you know, do uh, join us right here on Twitch for that as well. Uh, thank you, Aaron Sun, for the cheer. Um, thank you, Punker, for for the guilt. Um, and uh, yeah, so so check all that out. Also, I don't know if this is happening or not, um, but if you are interested in Big D doing the stand, write in at hostatshadowntv.com or tweet at him and let him know that that's something you want to see because I think Buddy has a hard on for doing the stand, which is coming out, I believe, this year, right? Uh, the yeah, in December, I think. In December, yeah. yeah. So if you guys want that. Let him know. He'll probably try to drag us along for it. We're going to tell him, listen, we just did Lovecraft Country. We're wiped. And uh, Big D you're, Big D's going to do a one-man show. Maybe Big D and the King B can do the stand together while Ash and I, I just do movies. Amazing. Yeah. I think that sounds amazing. Yeah. Okay, guys. But thanks. <laughs> Everyone's like, I am there. Black Nerd says, yes, yes, yes. But uh, but yes, uh, let, let him know, guys. So write in again, host at shadowntv.com. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Ash, uh, thanks for spending your Sunday night with me again. I hope you have a, a, a very restful evening. Bro, ho, bro, Don't research too hard. 
and uh, and I'm glad you're you're safe and have power and internet. Mm-hmm. All right, and yes, December is the expanse. Uh, I will be watching it. I so why I, yeah. and we will chat we'll, about it through text. Shout out time. We'll <laughs> tell you how much we enjoy it on Shappy Hour. <laughs> okay, we'll see you guys Bye, later. Guys. Good night. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower to meet with Holly. He came to get her back and to be her man, but Hans and his buddies fucked up the plan, and that's about when everything went sour at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Alice. And with a little help from Yeah.